In my programme yesterday, I discussed the British general election. I discussed the long-term problems that explained the Conservative Party's decline. I also discussed the problems that the Labour Party probably faces as it wins a mass, as it has just won a massive majority on a relatively small share of the vote. But one thing I didn't mention in my programme, and which we barely discussed in the parallel programme that Alex Christoforou and I did on the Duran on the topic of the British general election, was the effect of the Alensky curse. This is a concept um, invented, or perhaps more properly discovered, by my colleague and friend Alex Christoforou, to discuss, to describe the way in which over close commitment to Ukraine um, acts against the interest of elected politicians in the West. And we've had example after example of this. We have a major example of this in France, where President Macron's popularity is now in rapid decline. And whatever the outcome of the parliamentary elections, the second round of the parliamentary elections in France tomorrow, it looks like a certainty that President Macron's position as President of France is going to be significantly undermined. And perhaps, as I've speculated, he'll feel that he has no real choice but to step down. I didn't, however, discuss the effect of the Alensky curse on the British general election, but I'm going to do so now. As I said yesterday, there are long-term explanations for the decline of the British Conservative Party. And um, in my opinion, these problems are now becoming systemic and critical, and it is very, very difficult to see how the party can turn the process round. For one thing, there is still no agreement within the party about where um, the mistake is being made, what, what direction to take, whether to swing back towards being a more right-wing party, um, shoring up support amongst more right-wing voters, the view, uh, sh uh, the view taken by those who feel that the problems of the party arise from the fact that it moved towards a more centrist, more leftist position, and by contrast, the view that the view of others that, on the contrary, victory is to be won on the central central ground, that the party's mistake was that it moved too far to the right and that it should move more further back towards the centre. Already I've been reading articles by proponents of each of these propositions from the Conservative Party in the British media. But always and invariably there is one great absence, one, the elephant in the room, which nobody wants to talk about, and that is Ukraine and the conflict in Ukraine. Note that the only party that gained support significantly in the elections um, on Thursday in Britain was Reform UK, whose leader, Nigel Farage, has emerged as the big sceptic of the conflict in Ukraine. And note also that in London, the former Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, who is also well known for taking strong anti-war positions, not just on the Ukraine war, but on many others, and who took a strong position, or has taken as strong a position on the war in Ukraine as it is possible to do within the framework of the British centre-left. Anyway, he triumphantly won re-election as an independent in his Islington constituency, notwithstanding that, um, notwithstanding the fact that he was running against a Labour candidate 
and many assumed that he would struggle to win election. Compare that with the situation of the Labour leader and now Prime Minister Keir Starmer in his constituency in Camden. Normally, one would expect that the leader of a party that has just won a thumping 412-seat majority in the House of Commons would be triumphantly re-elected in his constituency. In fact, Starmer faced an independent anti-war candidate, one who's made most issues about, it must be said, the Gaza conflict. And Starmer's vote in Camden fell by 10,000 votes as compared with what he had previously won in the election in 12, 2019. So anti-war candidates, anti-war positions in Britain tend to do well against those political leaders who appear to take pro-war stances. Now, I've been careful to talk about anti-war and pro-war because apart from Nigel Farage, there is a general avoidance of the topic of the conflict in Ukraine. There is still, I think, a great reluctance in Britain to let oneself be framed as a Putin stooge by the political establishment. Nigel Farage, so far, has been the only political leader who's been prepared to risk that kind of criticism. And perhaps, given the extent of his already strong support in the country, perhaps he's the only person who can actually risk that kind of criticism and survive it without experiencing significant damage. And I'm going to say what I think is the general feeling in Britain about the conflict in Ukraine and what the mood of the country is on this issue. Briefly, I think it's a case of weariness, exhaustion with the war. I don't think that most people in Britain understand the issues of the war terribly well. I don't think most people in Britain um, are particularly well informed about the Russian perspective of the war. After all, access to Russian media has become much more difficult in Britain than it was. I don't think that most people in Britain have much fundamental sympathy with President Putin or his government, not because they know a great deal about him, but pre precisely because they don't. But many people in Britain at the outset of the war were led to think that Ukraine was um, winning hands down against the Russians, that it was fighting a gallant and heroic war against a Russian Goliath and was winning. And I think expectations were raised back in 2022 that the war would soon be over, that Ukraine would win, that there would be peace. And instead, the war has ground on. And as it has ground on, it has become increasingly difficult for the British establishment to pretend that Ukraine is winning the war anymore. On the contrary, I think there is a general understanding, even amongst the wider British electorate, that Russia is gradually gaining the ascendancy, that it is winning the war in Ukraine. Again, it's important not to overstate things. Most people do not know the details of the fighting you know, they're not familiar with the names of places like Chasov Yar or um, Avdevka or, or Cheretino or all of these places which I talk about in such detail in my programmes. But they've noted that the war has not been won by Ukraine. The 
Ukraine seems to be on the defensive, that it's costing the West more and more to keep the war going. And they probably also sense that most of the world really doesn't seem to be signed up for the war in the way that the British government has been. So I think there is a genuine sense that things are not going well in Ukraine. And perhaps the better thing to do is to negotiate and to seek peace. But where I think the Ukraine war has its biggest electoral effect is in this. People in Britain, people in most of Europe, are experiencing pressure on living standards. Economic growth in Britain has been essentially non-existent ever since the time of the 2008 crisis. There is growing pressure from high prices. There is a widespread sense that things are not going well in Britain economically. And what I think the general sentiment in Britain about the stance of the British government and the British political class is about the conflict in Ukraine. The general feeling is that the British political class is far too involved and immersed in it. They're so obsessed with Ukraine that they're losing interest in the problems that people in Britain are experiencing. People in Britain note and listen and they're aware of the fact that the British government never seems to be short of money to send to Ukraine. British political leaders never seem to find opportunities, to lose opportunities, miss opportunities to talk about Ukraine or to talk to President Zelensky or to visit Kiev or to do any one of those things. But even as they talk to Ukraine, about Ukraine, talk to Zelensky, speak always about their support for Ukraine, all of the problems that people in Britain really are worried about, immigration, the economy, the state of the education system, the housing crisis, all of these things don't seem to get the same degree of attention. And... I think that is causing growing resentment and growing frustration. And the government, the outgoing government, has experienced this fact directly. In the case, in fact, of the government, it was elected in 2019 with a big majority, not, of course, a majority on the scale that the Labour Party has just achieved, but still a big majority of 80 in the House of Commons in order to get Brexit done. And as the government, Boris Johnson, promised to provide to the British people the benefits of Brexit, which some saw as control of the borders and a restriction of immigration, and which others saw as an enhancement of the overall economic situation, an improvement of the economic situation in Britain itself. And of course, what happened was first, the government had to deal with the pandemic. Well, many people feel annoyed and angry about that, but perhaps they would forgive it. But then as soon as the pandemic ended, Boris Johnson, the prime minister, the government became obsessed and focused on Ukraine. And the result is that immigration has continued, or so people feel. The economy has not been turned round. And Boris Johnson seemed more interested in talking to his friend, President Zelensky, Prime Minister Sunak, ultimately perhaps with some wobbles at the beginning, followed that track. And, well, that, I suspect, is one reason 
why so many people ultimately lost interest in the Conservative Party and the Conservative government. They felt that it was not interested in them, so they lost interest in it. And they decided that the time had therefore come to try someone else. Well, the British government, the new British government, the government led by Keir Starmer shows no sign of learning from this mistake, because the mistake is what it was. Already, it seems, I understand that one of the very first foreign leaders that Keir Starmer as Prime Minister has spoken to is none other than President Zelensky. He has apparently assured Zelensky of Britain's continued support, and the person that he's appointed as Defence Secretary, uh, John Healy, is another notable hardliner on the Ukraine issue. The obsession with Ukraine has the political class in Britain in its grip. They don't seem to be able to see beyond it. They've convinced themselves that it is somehow an important issue. And they don't seem to understand that it may be an important issue for them, but it is not at all important for the people on the housing estates, in the factories, in the offices, in the suburbs, who have many other problems that they worry about an awful lot more. Anyway, enough of this. Um, I expect that just as Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, Rishi Sunak, Grant Shapps, all of these people have been condemned by the Alensky curse. The same curse will soon come after Keir Starmer, um, David Lammy, the new Foreign Secretary, Mr Healy, all of the others. Anyway, let's move on. We've discussed Britain enough. As I say, more of the same on economic policy, more of the same on foreign policy, more of the same on Ukraine, all leading down a blind alley. But anyway, let's move on and discuss other things. And let's talk first about the first serious attempt at diplomacy to end the, the Ukraine war that has taken place since the collapse of the Istanbul Accords, the ones that were almost agreed by the Russians and Ukrainians in Istanbul at the end of March 2022, and which the Ukrainians afterwards, on the urging of Western governments, walked away from. Well, there's been, as I said, the first serious attempt to try to resume diplomacy, and to a chorus of criticism from people in Europe, the attempt has been made by Prime Minister Orban of Hungary. Now, Orban has visited Kiev, and he has also visited Moscow, which violates, goes against a taboo. Western leaders occasionally say that they're prepared to talk to prep to President Putin, and on several occasions they're given the impression that it is in fact President Putin who isn't prepared to talk to them, but in fact, as has become increasingly clear, there is some kind of hidden agreement amongst them, at least in Europe, that none of them should speak to Putin or have any dealings with him until the moment comes when President Putin is prepared to put up the white flag, an event which will never happen. Viktor Orban, much more realistic, much more, much more realistically, has understood this, and he's gone to Kiev, tried to urge President Zelensky to declare a unilateral ceasefire, a proposal which the Ukrainians rejected outright, and then Orban did the obvious next thing. He went to Moscow, where he's had a meeting with President Putin. 
Now, Orban has given interviews about his meetings with Putin, which were interesting, but perhaps didn't take us very much further. Um, but he has also made public comments in a press conference, or rather a joint address to the Russian media. It's basically the Russian media now, which took place in the Kremlin. And it is these comments which I am going to read. Now, at this making of press statements, Putin also made certain introductory comments. I'm going to skip those because they take us no further than what um, uh, Putin has said in the past. I'm going to I'm going to go directly to the Kremlin's um, translation of what Viktor Orban said. He said the following: "Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, today I met with the President of Russia for the eleventh time. This meeting is special because it is being held at the time of at a time of war." when Europe badly needs peace. Peace is what Europe needs most of all. We see the struggle for peace as the main task for the next six months of our European Council presidency. Now, here already, Orban is talking not only realistically, but in my opinion, is setting the right set of priorities. Now, I say all of this, again, I understand that there are many, many people who don't like Viktor Orban. They find him too right wing. They don't agree with his stance on immigration, even though it's a very popular one in Hungary. They talk about him being some sort of a populist. They don't like his economic policy, which follows dirigiste patterns, all that kind of thing. But on the single most important issue, preserving peace in Europe, well, I'm going to say it straightforwardly. I think he is talking absolutely correctly, and I agree with him. Europe badly needs peace. Peace is what Europe needs most of all. To me, that is a no-brainer. That is absolutely obvious. Preserving peace if it is possible to do, ought to be the first duty of a statesman. Now, sometimes it is not possible to do. I'm not a pacifist. I understand that there are times when war is unavoidable. But that is never a reason for deprioritizing the quest to preserve peace. Orban gets it. It's incredible that none of the leaders of any of the big European countries, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, or Britain do. Anyway, do we move on? We see the struggle for peace as the main task for the next six months of our European Council presidency. So, Hungary is president of the European Council, of the European Union as a whole. And all sorts of people in the European Union have said that Viktor Orban has gone to Moscow. He's going there all by himself. He's doing so purely as the pre uh, uh, prime minister of Hungary. He does not speak for the European Union. Well, he begs to differ. He says, look, we are the president of the European Council. If that's have to have any meaning, we are going to exercise those prerogatives that come with that position to the fullest extent that we can. We understand that peace is the priority and we're going to do everything we can to try to achieve peace. Now, he's not promising that he will succeed. All he is promising is that he is going to try and he's going to try to do it out of a sense of duty to the people of Europe. Anyway, he then goes on to say this. I have told Mr. President, he of course means Putin, that Europe received the greatest impetus for development during peaceful 
decades. And again, that is to me absolutely obvious. Peace is the precondition for long-term sustained economic and social progress. Now, sometimes it's possible to achieve quite a lot of economic progress in times of war. Famous example is the United States, which boomed during the Second World War. Russia also is experiencing something of an economic boom at the present time. But over the long term, sustainably, properly, stably, peace is indis indispensable to achieve economic progress and impetus, as Orban puts it, for development. After all, as the Romans used to say, um, peace is when sons bury their fathers, war is when fathers bury their sons. How can you achieve impetus, steady development in those sort of conditions? Anyway, he then goes on to say this. This is public statements or bun made in the Kremlin with Putin standing alongside him. We in Europe have now been living in the shadow of war for two and a half years. This is causing enormous difficulties in Europe. They are, absolutely. We saw the effects of that in the European Parliament elections. We're seeing the effects of that in France with the parliamentary elections now. We've seen the effect of the Elensky curse in Britain with the defeat, the collapse of the Conservative Party. We cannot feel safe. We see pictures of destruction and suffering. What other European leader is talking about this? They all talk about Ukraine fighting, uh, um, defeating aggression, that kind of thing. What about destruction, the destruction of Ukraine, the suffering that is taking place there, the simple expression of human compassion? We never hear any of that. We never hear that from any of the major leaders, the ma leaders of the major European powers. We never hear that, by the way, from the United States government either. In fact, we hear cynical and ruthless statements about how cost-effective the war is, about the way in which the United States is weakening Russia, supposedly, at minimal cost to itself. It's never pointed out the price that you, Ukraine, the Ukrainian people are paying. And of course, and besides, the idea that Europe is achieving anything as a result of this, or rather the West is achieving anything as a result of this war, is simply wrong. What they're doing is making Russia angrier and stronger. Anyway, he then, Orban, goes on to say, this war has already started affecting our economic growth and our competitiveness. Another statement. I would have thought of the obvious. I've just been to Germany. I've seen the rise in prices that have taken place there. We hear report after report of the deindustrialization processes that are underway in Germany. Um, in, U in Britain, as I discussed at the outset of this program, there is now um, growing um, economic deprivation amongst more and more people. People are unhappy about the pressure on their living standards. We see economic growth in Russia. We see economic growth in Asia. All that talk a few months ago about the Chinese economy being in crisis has been shown to be completely untrue. We see economic growth in India, which has been very careful to preserve its economic links with Russia and is now importing the cheap oil and before long the cheap gas, some of which used to go to Europe, just saying. We even see economic growth of a certain type in the United States. But in Europe, we are in grave difficulties. And again, Orban is talking about it. He's making the connection 
between the conflict in Ukraine and what is going on economically in Europe and the pressure of living on living standards there. And again, what leader of any major European power is saying that? Are you hearing those words from the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen? Of course not. Are you hearing that from the president of the European Council, Charles Michel? No again. Anyway, let's move on. In general, as I have already told Mr. President, Europe needs peace. Over the past two years, we have realized that we will not achieve peace without diplomacy, without channels of communication. Peace will not come by itself. We need to work for it. Again, is that not a statement of the obvious? How can one agree peace unless one works to achieve it? Of course, we can demand Russia's unconditional surrender, which is what in the West we have been doing. But does anybody now, two and a half years into the war, with the Ukrainians in full-scale retreat on every part of the front lines, with the Russians relentlessly advancing right across the front lines, does anybody seriously believe that that will happen. And if Western leaders want to reverse those military trends, don't we all know the enormous risks that they're taking on? I've talked about them in program after program. Surely working, trying to undertake diplomacy, trying to maintain find negotiated solutions is the only way forward. Western leaders, as I discussed in my previous program, now grudgingly talk about this. They say that at the next summit meeting, peace summit meeting, after the debacle in Switzerland, the Russians must participate. But they still don't want to talk to them. They don't still don't want to have channels of communication to them. Well, how can you involve the Russians in negotiations if you won't talk to them? Orban, again, seems to be the only European leader, at least the only European leader of consequence, <laughs> Robert Fizzo, it must be said, is an exception, who is prepared to break with the consensus and state what is obviously true. And then Orban goes on to discuss, to the extent that he can, the meeting that he had with Putin. I was just discussing with Mr. Put President, I was Putin today, the ways to achieve peace. I wanted to know what the shortest road to end the war is. I wanted to hear Mr. President's opinion on three important questions, and I heard his opinion. What does he think about the current peace initiatives? What does he think about a ceasefire and peace talks? And in what succession can they be carried out? And the third thing that interested me was Mr. President's vision of Europe after the war. I am thankful to Mr. President for this open and honest conversation. In other words, Orban didn't go to Moscow with a peace plan in his pocket. He went there to hear what the Russians had to say. And that's the first job of a mediator. That's the first job of somebody who wants to start with to start a proper process of negotiation. I have been involved in many, many negotiations in my time. And the first thing you do is you find out what the other side says they want and how they feel things should proceed. And you might agree with them or you might not, but at least you know where you stand and where the other side stands. And Orban, again, 
is doing the obvious thing. Note that amongst the things that Orban was asking Putin about was Putin's vision of Europe after the war. And that inevitably touches on the new security architecture that the Russians are now increasingly talking about, one which must encompass the other great Eurasian powers, China first and foremost. Anyway, and then Orban concludes with these words. In the recent two and a half years, there are practically no countries left that could contact both one and the other opposing parties. Hungary is just one of such few countries. This is why I was in Kiev this week, and this is why I am in Moscow now. From my experience, I understood that the positions are poles apart. Very many steps are needed to be done to become closer to the end of the war. However, we have made the most important step, we have established contact, and I will continue to work towards this end. Thank you. That is what a mediator does. Obviously, the two sides are poles apart, exactly as Orban says. You find out what the stance of each side is, and then you establish some kind of communication between them and see whether over time you can start to bring them closer together. Now, again, there's no guarantee of success. Let me point out once more, Orban is not offering such a guarantee of success. But he is doing that which a mediator, always a proper mediator, always does. He finds out from each side what their position is, and then he sees if he can convey ideas between the two and start some kind of process of discussion in order to get things moving. Anyway, I'm going to finish with the very last part of this. Um, well, it wasn't exactly a press conference, um, the, these, these press statements, because there was a, I thought, rather comical um, epilogue to these very interesting words of Orban's. And there was a question from one of the journalists. How did Mr. Zelensky react to your peace ceasefire proposal? What did he say to that? That was obviously addressed to Orban, probably from a member of the Russian media. And Orban said, I told that to the president of Russia. And then the question followed. Mr. President, could you tell us? And Putin said straightforwardly, no. <laughs> so that's that's where we are, which is, by the way, the right thing. You don't discuss, if you're a mediator, you don't discuss um, what is going on in the mediation process. All sides, if a mediation process is going to have any chance of success at all, a mediation process needs to be conducted in a confidential way. That, by the way, was one of the things that caused the entire Istanbul process to fall apart. Now, anyway, there we are. So Orban understands the issue. He understands the importance of preserving peace. He understands that without peace in Ukraine, economic development in Europe, all of the European countries, is going to be stunted with all the political consequences that follow from that. He understands that the war is causing suffering and devastation. He's not going around reading out lectures to each side, telling them you're to blame for everything. He's certainly not doing that with Putin. He knows perfectly well that if he did that with Putin, he wouldn't get anywhere at all. And he's far too mature and intelligent a statesman to do any of that. And he is finding out from each side what their position is, even though he's already explained to the Ukrainians that in their own interests, they should seek a ceasefire now because they are clearly and visibly losing the war. A proposal which the Ukrainians predictably rejected. 
tell me what Orban is doing which is wrong. I don't see it. It seems to me he is doing everything right. Well, you wouldn't know that from the chorus of disapproval, of angry condemnation there, have, there has come from all sorts of people across the European Union. So far, only Robert Fietzer, amongst the European leaders, has come out and said that he supports Orban. In fact, Fietzer has gone further. He said that if he had been fully well in health, he would have been glad to have gone along with Orban, to join Orban in this meeting with Putin. But all of the others, the Germans, the French, the Italians, the Spanish, or the British, they are all openly condemnatory of what it is that Orban is trying to do. This is not only wrong, I'm going to suggest it might very soon turn out to be unsustainable. First of all, what Orban is doing is what the global community overwhelmingly supports. That is the message, the true message, that the summit in Switzerland provided. Most countries did not attend that summit meeting in Switzerland. A large number of countries that were invited refused to go. Of those that did, most of the significant ones outside the West, about all of the significant ones outside the West, refused to sign the um, final communique. In fact, the numbers of signatories to the final communique were so poor that in order to try to make the numbers seem more impressive than they were, as I have discussed in many programmes now, all kinds of manipulations and tricks had to be done. So the European Union signed the document three times <laughs> and in different by getting different European institutions to sign it. The Patriarch of Constantinople affixed his signature, though he does not represent a state. And though the Turkish government was furious about that and pointed out that this is a violation of Turkish sovereignty because the Patriarch of Constantinople is technically a Turkish subject. And anyway, the Swiss sheepishly had to withdraw his signature from the communique because it was clearly invalid. So that summit showed most of the world supports that which Viktor Orban is trying to do. And I said that none of the big European countries um, so far support him. All of them condemn him. That might change depending on what happens in the parliamentary elections in France on Sunday. Uh, Marine Le Pen has now said that if her party wins a majority and forms a government, that will be the end of any proposal, any suggestion of sending French troops to Ukraine. And she also said that the permission that Macron has purportedly given to the Ukrainians to allow use of French weapons to attack targets inside Russia, that will end. Now, it has to be said, Le Pen would probably be going beyond her legal remit, or rather her Prime Minister, Jordan Bardella, if he took that position, would probably be, get, be going beyond her remit if they took that stance, because foreign and defence policy in France is the prerogative of the president, who would still be Macron, unless he did what I think he might do, which is stand down. But the parliament probably does have the power to check or even stop the president pursuing these kind of initiatives. And that is what Marine Le Pen appears to be promising in advance of the elections.
Obviously, she's doing that because she knows that this is a popular stance with the French people. And she hopes by taking that stance that it will maximize support for her party in the second round of the elections tomorrow. Having said that, I am prepared to take her at her word. If Jordan Bardella does become Prime Minister of France over the next couple of days, following a win by the Rassemblement National in the French parliamentary elections, I, suspect, I expect that that is the stand that they will take. Anyway, we will see whether that happens. But it's not just an unsustainable position because the French might vote the Rassemblement National into power tomorrow, nor is it an unsustainable position, the stance that the European leaders are taking, rejecting what Orban is doing because most of the world agrees with Orban and because large numbers of European voters agree with Orban as well. It is probably an unsustainable position because one senses that the tides are shifting in the United States. Now, it is increasingly clear, and I'm not going to get into the details of this, it is increasingly clear that the president in the United States, Joe Biden, is trying to preserve his position, both as president and as candidate of the Democratic Party for the presidential election in November. He's just tweeted to that effect. He's given what I thought was a rather presumptuous interview in which he appeared to suggest that the situation would only change through the intervention of the Almighty. He clearly wants to continue as president. He continue, obviously wants to continue as a candidate. In his mind, probably the two things are conflated, about which I suspect politically he is right. And anyway, he appears to be digging in and his immediate circle are closing ranks or trying to close ranks around him. And I gather that there was a meeting with the governors of the various states, the democratic governors of the various states, and they all pledged allegiance to the president. Having said that, it seems that many of the donors are very unhappy and that there's growing criticism of this position that the president is taking and that the media, the Democratic Party aligned media, are becoming increasingly critical also. If the president maintains his current stance, there is a risk that this will become the big issue in American politics, not who is going to win the election in November, but whether the president is going to remain in post or not. And that, of course, both for him and for the Democratic Party, would be the biggest disaster. So one way or the other, I expect that this is going to be resolved. But it looks to me as if the damage, one way or the other, has also been done. It is going to be very difficult to persuade a critical mass of American voters to support the president in the election in November after what has happened, especially given that so many members of his own party now think that he should stand down. And if he does stand down and is replaced by someone else, someone else who I suspect can only be Kamala Harris, well, that will only result in a whole new set of problems. Now, I am not in the prediction game where American politics are concerned. This is a very, very difficult country. The United States is a very, very difficult country to read. But it does look to me that the odds have shortened 
on a Trump presidency um, in, uh, um, in, in January with Donald Trump, more likely than not now, to win the election in November. And Trump has increasingly signaled that he is uncomfortable with the further prolongation of this war. He's not made clear what his ideas for ending it are, but I increasingly get the sense that he does want to end it. Now, Donald Trump has a close relationship with Orban, their friends, and it could be that if he is elected president, the steps that Orban is taking now will find support from the most powerful office holder in the West, Donald Trump as president of the United States, assuming, of course, that Donald Trump does indeed win the election. And then, of course, all of these European leaders who are so critical of what Orban is doing could find the rug being pulled from under their feet. They could find themselves in a position where they are not only isolated, but seem exposed and in some way perhaps even ridiculous. Now, given that they are politicians of a sort, I would have thought that they would understand that. And I would have thought that they would be doing what they can, <laughs> at least to soften their criticism in case some of the things that I've been talking about actually happen. And, well, it may be that they do sense that um, the ground beneath their feet is shifting. There is a report in Bloomberg today that the Europeans are now adding their voice to those people in the Democratic Party who think that the president should stand down. I suspect the reason they're doing that is because they do not want to see Donald Trump elected, obviously for many reasons, but because of the war, his stance on the war in Ukraine first and foremost, and even more because they are now very worried that if Donald Trump is elected, he and Orban will get together and the outcome will be, with respect to the war in Ukraine, the one I have just said. Anyway, these are complex times. I'm not sure how this is going to turn out. To repeat again, Orban is not promising any positive outcome to his mediation efforts, but at least he is trying, and as far as I am concerned, he is saying the right things, and for that reason, in what he is doing, I think he merits support. Possibly, if Donald Trump is elected in November, he will have an, a much stronger hand than the one he has now. And, of course, if Donald Trump isn't elected in November, and assuming that the war goes on in the way that it does, well, <laughs> the outcome will probably, in that case, be a Russian victory, and Orban's stance will have been shown to have been correct all along, and probably he will reap the political benefit, and all of the other leaders who are opposing him will all be struck by the Alensky curse. So there we go.
Now, before I turn to the topic of what's actually going on in Ukraine, the latest news on the battlefront, I want to discuss another election that has taken place, which is the one in Iran. And um, perhaps somewhat unexpectedly for some people, the victor with um, 53% of the vote was Mazud Bezeshkian, who is sometimes referred to as a moderate or a reformer. He's at times spoken about the fact that Iran might want to improve its relations with the United States. Anyway, a victory which is perhaps unexpected for some people in the West. I do not in any way pretend to be an expert on Iranian domestic politics. But the moment I learned that Pazeshkian had been granted permission by the Guardianship Council, whatever it's called, the body that filters presidential candidates um, to stand in the election, my own sense was that he probably was in with a good chance of success. Now, I say that because my own sense of Iranian politics is that the ground constantly shifts and that one of the skills of the Iranian regime, if you want to call it that, is that it understands fairly well the various currents in Iranian politics. So under Ebrahim Raisi, a conservative, there was a major stabilization of the fraught political situation in Iran. The condition of the economy improved. Um, Iran achieved a major diplomatic breakthrough through its rapprochement with Saudi Arabia. And Iran also managed to join the BRICS and to forge economic and military and political links with countries like China, Russia, and India, as well as asserting itself as a major player in the Middle East following the Gaza crisis. So this is the moment, having achieved that breakthrough, when the Iranian regime, I'll call it a regime, I understand some people perhaps don't like that expression, but I don't know what else to call it. The Iranian political system, if you like, took the view that a moment for greater relaxation, both domestically and in terms of international diplomacy, is in order. Um, I think the Iranian authorities understand very well that some of the strong social restrictions that um, the regime sometimes imposes or imposes within Iran itself, um, that there is often pushback against it, especially amongst, I understand, women. So somebody's brought in a secular figure who can promise some degree of relaxation on that front. The economy is improving, so why not allow that sort of relaxation domestically within Iran? And at the same time, a more personable, more moderate face can be projected towards um, other countries improving Iran's overall image in the Middle East and in the world. Now, much has been made about the fact that um, the new president, the new president, um, Pezeshkian, has spoken in the past of better relations between Iran and the United States and Israel. What is not perhaps quite so well known is that he is first and foremost a major advocate of closer relations with Turkey. In fact, he is apparently a um, member of a committee which promotes Turkish-Iranian friendship. And also he seems to be someone 
who the Saudis in particular feel that they can work with and get on with fairly well. There's been reports, for example, that the Saudi government has been especially happy at Bezeshkian's um, election. So uh, we read from Reuters, Saudi Arabia's king and crown prince, that's MBS, congratulated Masoud Bezeshkian on his election as Iran's president. I affirm my keenness on developing and deepening the relations between our countries and people um, and serve our mutual interests. So the Saudi, Saudi news agency quoted Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman as saying. So there we go. So, Bezeshkian, perhaps the right person to do, to do those things. And of course, Bezeshkian has also received congratulations from his new uh, BRICS partners. Uh, first and foremost, President Putin, one of the first to get off the block. He wrote, too wrote to um, uh, Pazeshkin, I hope that your activity as president will facilitate the further boosting of constructive bilateral cooperation on all tracks to benefit our friendly peoples in the interests of easing regional security and stability. And um, we're told that Putin noted that Moscow and Tehran efficiently coordinate efforts in resolving the pressing issues of the international agenda. I wish you success, good health and prosperity. Now, that doesn't, of course, preclude eventual attempts by Bezeshkin to improve relations with the United States. Many Iranian leaders have tried to do that. I remember President Khatami tried it. <laughs> uh, President Rouhani tried it. Bezeshkin, for all I know, might be the next person to try it. All of those attempts have come to nothing. I suspect it will be the same with any attempts that President Bezeshkin makes. I do not believe that someone who has emerged out of the regime and who has been supported by the Guardianship Council, or the, whatever the filter, filtering body is called, is going to want to disrupt the already strong relationships which Iran has achieved with BRICS countries, with Saudi Arabia, with China, with Russia, and India, or will want to change course in terms of what Iran is going to do in any substantive way and nor will he want i would have thought to get into a direct clash with iran's supreme leader ayatollah khamenei who continues to have all the strings of power defense security and foreign policy gathered in his own hands so continuity i suspect in Iran and the Iranian regime recalibrating its image and perhaps to some extent its policies as it seeks to benefit from the new conditions which it achieved. That is my assessment of what this election means. I want to repeat again I'm not an expert on Iranian policy, but I certainly don't expect any drastic change in Iran's um, overall relationships. Why would Pazeshkian want to disrupt something which is already working? And I noticed that both he and the other candidates, some of whom are classified as conservatives, spoke very warmly about each other in the election and continue to do so after Bezeshkian won. Anyway, let's move on now and talk about that perennial conflict, the one in Ukraine, the one that is driving all the issues. And again, I understand and I accept once more 
that I'm not a military expert, as I've said many times, I'm not the person who's perhaps best qualified to understand all these various moves and counter moves. But to reiterate, since we're talking about a war, I don't think it is possible to talk about this conflict intelligently unless one understands or has a sense of what is actually going on on a granular basis on the battlefronts. The same with economics. I don't think it is possible to talk about economics, the economy of any particular country, intelligently and in an informed way, unless one has a granular understanding of that economy. Anyway, let's talk about what is going on in the war. And, you know, this is my own take on the situation, which is that after the last couple of days, which were disastrous for Ukraine, the Russians continue to capitalize on their advances and continue to push forward. Now, in Volchansk, in Kharkiv region, a group of forces north have given us their latest assessment of the overall situation. And my own sense is that um, overall, they remain fairly confident that things continue to move very much in their favor. In the Volchansk direction, fighting continues in Volchansk. The Ukrainians have doubled the intensity of transferring reserves to the right bank of the Volcha River. Over the past 24 hours, we foiled 12 attempts to force the river, killing up to 65 enemy soldiers. In the vicinity of Bugrovatka, this is the um, area, the, vi the, the village where the group of forces north has um, managed to cross the Seversky Donets River and develop a um, bridgehead potentially outflanking Ukrainian forces in Volchansk. Anyway, they say that in the village vicinity of Brukrovatka, we repulsed an enemy counterattack uh, of up to 10 uh, members of the special forces of Ukrainian military intelligence. Um, enemy losses amounted to seven enemy soldiers. So out of 10, seven were killed or wounded. There are significant advances in private sectors. And they're not giving, again, an exact explanation of what that means. But there is now apparently um, film evidence and photographic evidence which confirms that the Russians have captured more of the high-rise buildings in northern Volchansk, in the so-called citadel. And they say that the total advance of Russian troops in Volchansk direction amounted to up to 200 meters, which is fairly rapid pace of advance. And then they go on to say that in the Lipsy area, fierce fighting continued in the village of Gluboko. Fighting, fight, our fighters repulsed four attacks of the Ukrainian military, each up to a company in size. Now, I understand that a company numbers around 100 men. So these were big attacks, um, attacks of up to 100 men at a time. Um, and the group of forces north said that all of these attacks were repelled and that up to 70 enemy soldiers were destroyed, which again, I presume means killed. And the group of forces north says during the attacks on our positions, the enemy used grenades with poisonous substances. Well, they don't say what those poisonous substances were, and I'm not going to get into a discussion about that. And they say that over the past 24 hours, enemy losses amounted to more than 200 men. And then there's a long list of enemy equipment that was destroyed. And then they go on to say the enemy is increasing, increasing the intensity of its attacks on our positions and is trying to achieve tactical success at all costs. The 
uh, soldiers of the Kiev regime are going into battle under the influence of strong psychotropic substances and are using chemical weapons. That may be true, or it may not. It might be propaganda. It's the kind of thing that is often said. There have been situations when armies have given um, um, drugs to uh, their soldiers. The Germans did it on a big scale, by the way, during the Second World War. I'm not going to, again, second guess the truth or falsity of this particular statement. But anyway, they say, gradually, military intelligence, Ukrainian military intelligence units are being brought into the battle. So the Ukrainians are being forced to deploy more and more of their special forces to Volchansk. But so far, they're not making any progress. All the progress is being made by the Russians. And Group of Forces North says... The Kiev regime needs a localized victory to have a chance to stay in power. However, Ukrainian society has a different opinion on this matter. Victory will be ours. So a group of forces north gives a sense that they're fairly confident that they have the initiative in Kharkiv region, that they're continuing their advance, that they have the Ukrainians firmly on the back foot, and that they are, as they said in a previous report, steadily, step by step, squeezing the Ukrainians out of Volchansk. Now, another, Ukraine, another Russian commander has spoken about the situation in the Volchansk and Kharkiv area, and it is Major General Apti Alaudinov, who is a deputy at the main military political directorate of the Russian armed forces and the officer who also commands the Ahmad Special Forces, um, which is a Chechen unit fighting under the umbrella of the Russian National Guard. Anyway, he gave an interview, he's given an interview to Grozny Television. Grozny is the capital of Chechnya. And he said this, in all areas that the Russian defense minister in all areas Russian defense ministry units are advancing flushing out and destroying the enemy we have spent about a month in the Kharkiv area thanks to joint assault operations of various Russian units in Volchansk a great number of enemy personnel and equipment have been destroyed I think we will see more results in the near future and in principle already, which in principle already leads us to the logical completion of the special military operation. I think that we will finish this special military operation this year. In general, there is not a single area where the enemy can say that they have gained some advantage or have been able to gain ground or to make our units <coughs> retreat. The Ukrainians have pulled all their resources and reserves from all other directions and have pulled them, deployed them to the Kharkiv area. So Alaudinov thinks that this year, 2024, is going to be Russia's year of victory. We'll see. But he seems overall pretty confident about the situation in Kharkiv region where his troops are based. And of course, he's generally confident about the whole situation in the area of the special military operation. And in fact, we're getting lots of reports across the entire battlefields about the way in which things are developing. And, well, I've discussed the situation in Volchansk. Um, there's been less news from Kupiansk, Seversk and Chasifyar recently. I suspect that the Russians, having captured the micro-district in Chasifyar, are now consolidating and reorganizing and preparing to launch their big offensive that is coming. But there is... Very important and significant news coming from Toretsk. This is um, in the area between Shasafyar and the Avdevka sector. The Russian breakthrough in Toretsk 
looks unstoppable. Every day, more reports of more important fortified positions of the Ukrainian army passing under Russian control. Um, for, judging from the latest maps that I've seen, more than, I would say, two-thirds of New York, a village in the former part of the Toretsk uh, um, conurbation, not the city in the United States, needless to say. Anyway, more than two-thirds of New York seems to me to be now under Russian control. I might be wrong, but that's how it looks to me from my attempts to read the maps, to understand the maps. But all reports, all the mapping projects agree that the Russians are advancing in Toretsk, and there's been lots of film and pictures and of all of which, all of which, in aggregate, appear to confirm that fact. And, well, the biggest, most dramatic news continues to be in the area west of Ocheretino. We now have a big accumulation of news here. The Russians seem to have knocked the Ukrainians out of Yevgenivka. At least that's what I understand. They've captured um, a significant amount of territory north of the village of Novoselivka Persia, which looks to be their next major target uh, to the south. Um, presumably, once Novoselivka Persia has fallen under their control, they will then be able to capture, they will then switch towards capturing progress um, village to immediately to the north of um, Yevgenivka and it's likely that the attack on Vozdvizhenka the uh, village to the south of the road from Pakrovsk, Mirnograd at the road that leads on to Chasovya and Konstantinovka that that will be attacked as well. So the Russians making significant advances in this area. And, well, the other thing to say is that if Novoselivka Persia, which is apparently a small place, is captured by the Russians, and there are reports that the Ukrainians are all but cut off in Novoselivka Persia, and there are some claims that, in light of that, they might be in the process of abandoning this particular village. Well, if that is indeed the case, then the Russians are also strongly positioned to launch a further offensive from Novoselivka Persia towards Selidovo, which is another important town south of Pakrovsk, which is another major logistical hub for the Ukrainian army. The Russians are gradually tightening their, wet, uh, their net around these big Ukrainian logistical hubs. Akrovsk, which is exposed to attack if Pag progress falls. Um, Selidovo, similarly exposed if not for Selivka. Persia and Karlovka to the south, where the Russians are also advancing, falls. And Kurakovo, which is looking increasingly um, encircled, with the Russians clearing Krasnogorovka, advancing through the villages of Maximilianovka, immediately to the west of Kurakovo, and also major battle apparently underway further south still but also in the Kurakovo area um, fighting in Konstantinovka the village of Konstantinovka as well so steady Russian advances advancing right across the front lines and going back to Apti Alaudinov that's basically what he's saying. In all areas, Russian defense ministry units are advancing, flushing uh, out and destroying the enemy. 
with the Ukrainians suffering devastating losses, with the Russians, by the way, having apparently been able to piece together all the various component parts of the attackers missiles that they've been shooting down and finding out a great deal about the attack attackers which will enable them no doubt to develop even more effective countermeasures against it there was an interesting article in the russian media which said that the russians found that some aspects of the attackers seem to have been um, developed from american anti-ship missiles, presumably harpoons. Just saying. Anyway, the Russians gradually tightening their grip on the battlefield. And Alaudinov has been a very interesting commentator about the progress of the war. He's now predicting, again, victory for the Russians this year. Well, we will see. Speaking for myself, to repeat again, I am glad that Orban is at least trying to do that which no one else is doing. Start, get a real negotiation underway. Whether or not he succeeds, I don't know. But if he doesn't succeed, it'll be the European leaders who will pay the political price even as the Russians consolidate their control in Ukraine and their, the project for building up Eurasia and the multipolar system will be given a further huge advance. Well, this is where I end my program today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Don't forget to check out our video where you can find um, 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 more of our Football 24 series of um, um, items. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.